welcome to the course International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. Today we are going to discuss about the concept of the second birth in the context of disaster recovery from various lessons from the disaster recovery. In our last class we did discuss about the concept of Bodio second birth where people are forced to live some other place and they need to know a set of rules. So that is where we discussed about the concepts of fields and games because every game is followed with certain set of instructions and it has been played in a particular fields. So when the concept of field changes and the concept of game has to be adjusted with the set of instructions with that particular game. So this is where it takes time for anyone to adapt to the new set of practices. So this is where we are going to discuss about few disaster recovery aspects and then we try to understand you know how the concept of space is produced. So when we talk about the produced, we one of the important uh, theory we discuss is the production of space by Henry Lefebvre where he talks about three concepts which is the conceived space because each of these space in the post disaster context it is conceived by a certain visionaries. In the previous lectures we did discuss about Mayor Kora's visions in the reconstruction of Gibalina. Similarly you know so every disaster is an opportunity of a change. So how they take the how they uh, envisions this particular change you know how it informs the physical space. So that is what we refer to the conceived space. Whereas the perceived space it is based on the way people live you know the spatial practices how it shapes with the communities how they dwell within that particular space. But then as a habitual processes you know how they develop a particular emotions and attachment to a particular place that is where we refer to the concept of a lived space. Of course I am just uh, explaining this theory in a very superficial uh, manner so that you know every common man can understand it but it is a very deeper concept of which he talks about the production of space. Today I am going to discuss about three studies. One is my own study where I did in Gujarat earthquake study and the second one is a secondary study from the Build Back Better uh, El Savdar case and the third is the tsunami recovery. Again it is my own uh, research study. So I am going to discuss about some of these uh, interesting uh, relations how spaces have been transformed, what kind of mechanisms have worked, what did not you know so that is what we are going to discuss. So somewhere in 2002 when I was working in uh, for a study purpose in Gujarat in which in Kutch district where it has hit by a massive major earthquake and many of these uh, dwellings have been demolished and they were damaged, they lost many lives and uh, when I visited there you know I have visited a couple of villages and I did my work on that. So some of the uh, you know images of that time's destruction some of the schools were damaged, some of the hospitals were damaged, some of the historic forts were damaged, you know some of the industrial go downs were damaged, you know a lot of destruction but what you can actually observe is here you know uh, some of these traditional houses which we which are built with the wattle and dub constructions like bonga they majority of them they survived for that major earthquake whereas many of the houses which were built with the uh, brick and concrete houses you know they are mostly uh, suffered with damages you know especially in the corners in the junctions you know that is what we can see on the technical point of it again this is one of the image of the partially damaged hospital and some of the houses which were damaged partially and you know because when it is come partially damaged people were not able to live there and some of them they vacated the houses and obviously some of them who were homeless they started living in these uh, damaged houses you know. So these are some of the important uh, understanding uh, which I have got from the initial field work. 
So, one of my friend uh, Nataraj, uh, he just uh, spelled out in this way, shattered dreams, awful screams, nothing more, nothing more, shaken floor, fallen floor, nothing more, nothing more, silent boys, deserted toys, nothing more, nothing more, tumble stones, broken bones, nothing more, nothing more. And this was the scenario of the immediate impact of the disaster. And as I just said about the traditional forms, the traditional house forms, which are referred as the bungas in the local language, they survived and many of them, they are, some of them are built on a raised stone wall and they're made with the wattle and daub constructions. You know, these are some of the evidences and the, whereas the brick and concrete houses completely have demolished, you know. And these are the houses which were built by the compressed stabilized earth blocks later on after the post-disaster by different NGOs. So these are the typical uh, form of these dwellings. You can see these wattle and daub constructions which are again um, put in the, these kind of mud uh, construction and this is called otla, the raised platform. So where the women perform their uh, domestic activities like cooking food or you know cleaning certain things and they also do maintain regularly. There's the interior of these places and the exteriors. And some of these common facilities, they have these community halls, they have these small um, commercial space and the religious buildings. And uh, people have developed some kind of small open uh, bathroom. So when I said large infrastructure has been affected, first of all, schools is also a major impact factor. You know, the, one of the important buildings which affected the children's future because many of them, they are not able to go to school. So they almost in the first one year, the schools were closed and because they were shut down and different NGOs have come forward and they constructed with uh, temporary materials like the bamboo classrooms, you know, the, some of them, they were constructed with the paper pipes, the laminated paper pipes and the dining hall was made with the temporary with the canvas tents, you know. Uh, so, similarly, certain sieving machine training center for you know, providing an alternative livelihoods and training for the computers, uh, that is where they are done with the small trusses and, you know, so this is a kind of temporary rehabilitation efforts which has taken place. Whereas, when we move on from the stage one, which is a disaster impact and then we move on to the immediate relief and rehabilitation which is a temporary phase but then at some point of time they have to really uh, search for uh, locations for the permanent shelter and also what are the resources and how we can build that. So this is one aspect uh, you know where they, uh, the technology transfer took place from the Auroville and they uh, have adopted the compressed stabilized earth blocks, you know, the interlocking blocks where they talk about sand 60 to 65 percent, silt and 10 to 5 percent, clay about 15 to 20 percent and gravel about 10 to 15 percent. And of course, they make sure that the salinity is not greater than the 1200 ppm and pH values not less than. So in that way, this is a small uh, manufacturing unit at Kach Nau Nirman Abhyan. Today it is referred as Hunashala. And so similarly, the ferro cement channels, the compressed stabilizer blocks, these are the mud blocks and they cover with for two days and then later on they dry it for about 21 days. You know, so these are the interlocking blocks because so that the vertical reinforcement also can be placed in between these blocks, especially at the corners. So there are also other technologies uh, which have been adopted in the disaster recovery program. This is a photograph from Nirmiti Kendra in Hyderabad where they have talked about again the interlocking. So they have designed some kind of precast frames and these uh, hollow brick models where they put these blocks into these frames and that's how they formulate these either uh, roof panels or the wall panels like that. And in Gujarat, again, uh, you have these geodesic domes, which were also constructed. They're all earthquake resistant, you know, but similarly, this is a model which they have constructed by the Nirmiti Kendra. And in uh, Kach Navnidman Abhyan, they all did construct it about uh, using the CSAB blocks, about G plus one stories, and something similar to the Bunga structure, where there is a, a circular house and which has uh, intermediate bands, there is a uh, plinth band, sill band and the roof band and you know similarly it has a kind of octagonal conical roof structure which reflects to the traditional housing. 
they have also adopted some ferrocement channels, the uh, spiroidal domes and they have these prefab toilets, you know. So, the uh, variety of inputs which has been given based on some certain modern interfacing the modern and the traditional forms, okay. So, uh, these are the some of the houses in the village which I was studying, it was actually adopted by the Catholic Relief Services and there are many other NGOs who were working at that point of time. And what you can actually see is, you know, what they did was, they built exactly at the same location where their house was. So, in that way, the skeleton remains the same. You know, maximum in the, in cases where the house was completely destroyed, they either make it adjacent to that. So, there are some other uh, NGOs who have built up these concrete technologies, skeletas, they have built these, uh, uh, you know, concrete uh, houses. And this is again a hospital which was built even which can adapt to the nine riches scale. So, but interestingly, what one can notice is next to this, you know, next to this particular NGO provided house, they started building using their local stone and local uh, masons, they started building a stone shelters. You know, this is where their local understanding of their house. So, in, in fact, they were attached to this kind of uh, housing before and in fact, this community themselves, they have started building these things, you know. So, this is uh, something which we have to understand at that point of time. Of course, there are many studies later on uh, which have studied on Gujarat earthquake and but Interestingly, what is important in Gujarat earthquake is the public participation. They, they engage the community in the construction worker in work and they train them and the GSD may shoot certain guidelines for retrofitting and the newer constructions. And so in that way, uh, this is one of the case where we can actually refer with, uh, uh, you know, significant amount of public participation, the community engagement. And it was very easy for them because, you know, most of the people, actually they are either the craftsmen or they are having some tendency of working with these uh, laborious activities. So in that way, it was very easy to mould them and to train them into the um, construction work so that they can able to supervise their housing process. So many of the NGOs have worked on that process. So, uh, we come to a second study. This is from the Build Back Better, which is edited by Michael Leons and Theo Schilderman. And in that, uh, the editors brings forward many different cases from India, Nepal, Bangladesh, El Salvador, Peru, Colombia, Kenya. So, I am just showing one example of uh, the El Salvador case where it talks about the progressive housing uh, and uh, how it works. So, first of all, uh, I think everyone is aware that, you know, this is where we are talking about the El Salvador, which is the very smallest country in the Central America. And there is, uh, one is the poverty, 48 percent of the inhabitants of the El Salvador live in the poverty or in an extreme poverty. So, the NGOs like the Spanish Red Cross and the uh, Salvadoran Red Cross, they come together and they started working on this progressive housing as a solution. And uh, so, what does it mean? Because you see how this, the core, ha core house approach with this progressive housing, because the core house, you know, they immediately developed a core dwelling unit and then they give it to the uh, inhabitants, but then later on they gradually develop it. But here in the progressive housing, you know, uh, it goes in an incremental way in a different stages. You know, for example, uh, I think uh, every one of you are uh, aware of this Alexandros work, you know. So, where uh, we talk about um, the housing units which are delivered to the dwellers, the, the above one and gradually you know, after some time, how they modified these houses is almost like a hundred percent incrementality. So, in one of their projects, what they did was they have divided into stage three, you know, three stages of work. In stage one, they are contractors and the unskilled labor. In here, they are talking about the construction of the structural elements and the individuals of the each family member within the community and uh, employ creating some employment opportunities and the increased participation. Whereas the stage two, it talks about the site work supervisors and the materials. So, Red Cross have supplied some materials and necessary technical advice. And again, the Red Cross have supported this. And then here the completion, the portable waterable supply and the household plumbing system. Let me show you how it works. So, in the stage one, which is a partial construction. So, they develop 
the they basically do the excavation laying the foundation and they build an earthquake resistant structure and they just give this kind of skeleton you know what you can see a uh, house at the end of the stage one you have these spaces for windows where you have spaces for at the sill level and there's a roof you know there's a basic structure is given to them and this is the second stage is completed by the should be completed by the owners so what they should do is you know the lintels of the doors and windows so they purchase they put some money forward and then um, they try to do the finishing touches of the whole house and similarly you know if you look at the contributions the red cross has given materials that are not available locally the workshops has been conducted the, the technical support and monitoring the family bought some materials like doors and windows and the labor you know they also contributed to certain labor in stage 3 you know they they need to uh, you know complete this with the service point of it water supply and sanitation you know so here they install some sink with the two taps and removing the gray water connected systems that remove the gray water you know so like that there are some participatory workshops which were conducted so that you know uh, they are not only given something but they are trained in that so that they can manage it in a longer run. Of course, there were some issues with it, with the fire, especially with the land tenure, how do they purchase because some of them who are not recognized within this uh, program, they are not they, they are avoided in this. So obviously there are issues with the land tenure, how we can procure that. And for them they were not able to get into this program. So you know there are other uh, challenges in this particular participatory approach you know so now uh, we talk about the third case of the tsunami recovery in tamil nadu here i was working in um, tamil nadu and uh, i did three case studies you know how did i selected my case studies i visited uh, almost 17 villages in 16 uh, in six districts and I have I visited the most affected and the least affected and I also visited the in situ constructions and the relocated as well. So in that way I, when I was traveling around I could see the land of the northern part is more or less the fairly plain and whereas when you move towards the south it has uh, a small hilly uh, topography. And also here mostly uh, when I ever visited these villages they are mostly from the Hindu communities. Here I could able to get the mixed communities and most of the sou southern part of Tamil Nadu I could able to get the Roman Catholic communities. So and also the northern part is more of a shallow water seas and the deep water seas you know. So obviously when we talk about uh, shallow water and the deep water, the deep water uh, will have more fish and that is how it has given more economical standard of these fishermen you know. So I have selected one Dalit Thailand and one Tarangam, a village called Tarangambadi where even Danish people live still there some of them and the Muslim people and the fishermen communities. But this is a completely a Roman Catholic community Kovalam and here uh, the traditional panchayat is a church. So I have been uh, um, doing work on a participatory approach where I'm, I was almost living like a life of a fisherman, going to fishing with them, uh, talking to them, you know, understanding their daily behaviors, understanding their daily situations. And uh, this has given me a, a, a greater understanding how the society performs. You know, it's not a very shallow understanding because after spending months and months with them, so everyday behavior, how I was able to understand their festivals, how they have changed, you know. So this is one of the case where the case of Kovalam village, you know, so where this is a traditional village and you have these uh, ceremonial buildings, the church is in the center, that's the village center. So after the tsunami, what they did was they moved these uh, affected houses, almost 88 houses were affected in this region and they identified these 88 houses and they uh, have to move back because there is a, a coastal regulation zone which implies that okay you cannot construct anything beyond these 500 meters. You know, So in that way they have been able to found some of these lands uh, which are government owned lands. And first initially they made as a project of 89 houses, 88 houses and the church has approached some NGOs, the church has approached some NGOs and they have actually 
uh, given some support of the construction of the dwelling. So the land belongs to the government and then in that way these 88 houses were gone there. And later on the church realized why not we take this as an opportunity and why not we address the pre-disaster vulnerabilities. So that is where they have many frequent disputes with the neighbors, the water supply issues. So in that way some of these villagers came forward and they put some money forward and they bought some other lands. You know, and then the church has approached with other NGOs and they supported their construction activities. So in that way, the church plays an important role you know, in identifying and bringing together. So one of the important difference what happened was these people who were earlier having a houses but now they are having a tenure, tenure, you know, they are on only after 10 years, they will get their tenure. But whereas these people, they bought the land. So from the beginning, they had their ownership. So similarly, after that, the rule have uh, changed to Siyajud. Then later on, they brought two more uh, colonies here and then they started developing. But what kind of changes has happened? So earlier, these are the traditional forms. Many of them are joint families. There are about 400 households but then after the tsunami, they all scattered, they were disintegrated into nuclear families. And that's how it became 1,000 households after the post tsunami. You know? So this is a traditional housing pattern. They used to have a community well and nearby, it's very narrow alleyways, what you can see here. And these are some of the kind of uh, traditional pattern of these houses because they are living in the coastal side and it's very hot. And so in that way, they used to always have a shade in these places. You know? but Whereas the newer constructions, it has followed more of a kind of urban lifestyle where the grid iron patterns or the very linear patterns have been followed. And each house, they have, uh, when they were allotted like this, later on the communities, they started building a compound walls, you know, and they were given houses, but then they were, for the initial years, they were having issues with the water supply and sanitation. And people started extending their kitchens at the rear side because these are the fishermen communities. You know, they cook outside. So in that way, this is the auction center and you know, their harbor. So in that way, everything was near and dear in the old village setup. But then after the relocation, they almost have to walk for about two uh, kilometers. You know, uh, by taking their diesel, their net, their gear, you know, anything, their food, anything uh, which they have to carry for their sea purposes, you know, the fishing purposes. So they need to travel two hours. So about two kilometers. So in that way, what happened was their distances have increased. And earlier, the women used to see that, you know, their man is coming and they were able to go and take some food. Uh, and they wait for them. But now they cannot see their uh, boats. So now in that way, they are not able to go and uh, wait for them. And obviously when the men come back from sea, they are very hungry and they don't find the food and automatically they have, uh, they are become a bit furious and then they show all their anger on their house, you know, the family members. So this is how, you know, a small uh, aspect of not seeing, not meeting their family members with the food also have certain implications with their relationships. And uh, earlier they used to participate in the church activities regularly, but now because they are not able to travel for two kilometers uh, by walk, especially the older women, elderly people who were not able to come to the church regularly, you know, and whether it is an economic need, whether it is a cultural need, everything has become far away. And in fact, when they were living in these styled houses, that is where when they were realizing, you know, what kind of, uh, when should I get a new house, you know, a, a paka house, as a brick and concrete house. So, after the tsunami, the, when the NGOs have asked them, what kind of house you would like to have? So, that is where exactly they said, we want a paka house, but that is exactly what given to them, you know. But now they realize it's very hot, it's not to their uh, climatic needs. And similarly, the layout of the kitchen, in fact, the kitchen, they want to take the food from the kitchen, from which is facing to the outside, to the multipurpose room. So in that way, they are, according to their cultural norms, they don't want to take the food, show the food to others and take it to the other room. And also, the toilets, they, uh, some of them, um, they didn't like these attached toilets and then they oriented that from the other side, you know. And in fact, some of them, they even constructed a toilet outside. Like as I said, the land tenure and the ownership, the people who were at the 88 houses, they 
uh, they got only after 10 years, but the people who put the money for the by purchasing the land, at least they got the tenure, which indicates, imagine if they have to get married or if they have to spend some for any emergent activity, so they cannot sell these houses for the 10 years. Okay. Now, some of these uh, women, they have actually extended their house friends or shops for their economical needs because some of them, they lost their husbands. They extended their kitchens. And similarly, this is the second case in Tarangambadi. It's a Danish colony and this is Masili Mananada temple. And here, if you see, just to want to explain, this part of this settlement is occupied earlier by the Danish. You have the Dansberg fort and you have some of the colonial buildings here. And this part is mostly predominantly occupied by the Muslim community. It was goes back to the pre-colonial Muslim houses. And this is mostly the fisherman community. You know, you can see the spatial understanding how it's very vast in size and shape. And then it goes back to the fisherman. It's very closely knitted community. After the relocation, here SIFS was working, South Indian Federation of Fishermen Societies was working on it and Dr. Benny Kuriakos was the architect. And they have actually done with the concept of the houses and they actually did the whole habitat mapping exercise for this particular settlement. And then they were able to identify some land nearby and then that's where the new cluster, some of these, these affected people, they were all migrated to the newer place. And the older settlements, if you look at it, you know, they have these traditional houses, the tile roofs with the verandas, you know, the whole street networks are very um, friendly in nature because they are referred as talking streets in the evenings, you know, everyone sit outside and talk. And when we actually also gathered certain information through their mental maps, you know, like when we asked them about um, uh, how do you understand about this place, you know, how legible is this place is and uh, how it has changed. So some of them, they were able to draw some mental maps, but some of them, they were not able to draw any mental maps. So because for the first time, they were touching the pencil. So in that way, what we did was we given the maps of previous uh, settlement and the post tsunami settlement, before tsunami and after tsunami. And when we say give a hint of a landmark, let's say this is a Ranga, uh, this is a temple. Renuka Devi temple. Oh, then they say, oh, my house is here. Then they say, I used to move around this princess street to drop my child in the school, go to the market here, go to the ice factory here, you know, go to the harbor here. So in that way, he used to map all these points. The same thing when I refer to the school as a landmark, then oh, my house is here, then I move around, my children goes like this. But this mental map is a very important phenomenon because uh, it actually given as a hint that why there is a, uh, it is weakening the social networks across the communities. Because earlier these Muslim and the Hindu and the Christian communities, they were all linked with this princess street. So whether for the need of educational institutions or anything, they travel in this street. But today, after the tsunami, they are not able to walk down in this street. So in that way, many of them, when their interviews, they said, we are feeling very bored because my friends were not there, feeling isolated. I, we didn't understand what it is. But now with this map, we could able to see even a small walking pattern creates certain network, creates certain interaction and it has changed completely after the tsunami. And again, this is again a Dali Thailand, which I was used to go, these are about uh, 11 to 14 uh, villages, and we used to travel every day by uh, boat and then study about their houses. We did some focus groups. And so here also, you can see they already, before the provision has been handed over to the community, they already started expanding their kitchens and everything. So as a result, what you actually see here is you know, a variety of encroachments and their extensions. So for example, in these two houses, two of them, two brothers have got the house in the same uh, street. So immediate and, and as an adjacent manner. So what they did was they constructed a single roof to represent one family. You know, then extension of the kitchens at the rear side. And this woman, she lost her husband. And with she's left over with three children. And, you know, she got a house, but how shall she survive? So that is where she started expanding, uh, extended a shop in front of the house. And they have given a toilet, but then the toilet was converted as a puja rooms because they were, uh, you know, they were not comfortable as per the Vastu considerations. And 
though they were given some limited public space uh, opportunities, you know, people started encroaching the nearby places and they started uh, making other children playgrounds. And now at this point of time, they even made this as a small school. And I'm going to show you a small video of the how the people, the respondents, how they have responded, what are their understanding. So this is a going to be a small video. They feel very bored since uh, they are they were interacting with them, they sharing their burdens and everything no? Since they left, they don't feel comfortable here. They long for their company. okay
கிடையாது அதாவது இங்க இருக்கிற பொதுமக்கள் எல்லாம் கலந்து ஆலோசனை பண்ணி இன்னாருக்கு என்ன இடம் இன்னாருக்கு என்ன இடம் ஏன்னாக்க நாங்களுக்கு கலக்கறது தெரியுமா ஒரு தண்ணி வைப்பும் போடல ஒரு எந்த இதுமே இந்த பக்கம் இல்ல ஆனா அங்க இருந்தது எல்லாமே எங்க தெருவுல இருந்தது ஆனா இந்த தெரு இந்த பக்கம் வந்த பிறகு எதுவுமே இல்ல பைப்பே இல்லமா பைப்பு வாங்க அறுபது வீட்டுக்கு ஒரு பைப் போட்டுருக்காங்க அது எப்படின்னா தண்ணியே கிடைக்க மாட்டேங்குது அந்த சித்தோட மேல ஒரே வெயில்ல எல்லாம் இனிமே நீங்க இருக்க முடியாது வெயில்ல தான் காத்துல தான் உட்காந்து போறதுக்கு தூரம் இங்க தூரம் தான் இங்க வந்து ஓய்க்கு நல்லா இருக்குது எங்களுக்கு என்ன பார்க்க மீன் தொழில் பாக்குறவங்களுக்கு பக்கத்துல இருந்தா தானே கஷ்டம் இல்லாம இருக்கும் ஆமா ஆராய்ச்சி பொறுத்த வரைக்கும் தான் நம்ம வந்து தெரிஞ்சுக்க முடியும் ஆனா இப்போதைக்கு உள்ள சூழ்நிலைங்கன்னா மீன் கிடைக்கிறது கம்மி அதுக்கு முன்னாடி துடுப்பு போட்டுட்டு போகும்போதெல்லாம் கிட்டத்தட்ட மீன் கிடைக்கும் இங்கே வந்து கால் மணி நேரத்தில் கடலுக்கு போகிறோம் தொழிலுக்கு போயிடலாம் அங்கே இருந்து வரதுனா ஒரு அரை மணி நேரம் ஒரு மெடிக்கல் போகும்போது ஹாஸ்பிட்டலில் போகிறோம் கொஞ்சம் தூரமாக போகணும் ஒன்று அடுத்தபடியாக ரோடு போக்குவரத்து இல்லை இதுக்கு மேலே போட்டு போ கொடுப்பாங்கன்னு நினைக்கிறேன் அதே நேரத்தில் இப்போ நாங்கள் போயிட்டு போய் இப்போ நாங்கள் எங்கே இருந்தாலும் ஒன்றா தான் சார் இருப்போம் நாங்கள் பிரிஞ்சே இருக்க வந்து ஒரு சரித்திரமே கிடையாது நாங்கள் ஒன்றா தான் இருப்போம் இப்போ எங்கே இருக்கா அது தூரமாக கிட்டக்கையா அதை பற்றி பிரச்சனையே இல்லை நாங்கள் எல்லாம் ஒன்றா தான் இருக்கோம் இருக்க முடியாதா இருக்க முடியாது கடல் இங்கே வரும் பயந்து போட்டு நல்லா இருக்கு நம்மளுக்கு வந்து காத்து போகிறது இது தான் இப்போ நல்லா இருக்கும் நம்மளுக்கு கடைக்கு நல்லா இருக்குதா கடலில் கடலில் புழைக்கிற நம்ம தானே கடலில் புழைக்கிற நம்ம ஒரு மரமாட்டை இல்லை இந்த வெய்ய Again, I visited these places again after 8 years. Now what I can see in these newer clusters, initially they were given in a small house like this. But today these houses have been modified in this manner. They extended their porches in the traditional pattern. They brought these mangalore tiles or you know they have these tiled roofs. And wherever the spaces are left over, they convert it as a small church for, so that they put the sea sand and even the elderly women can sit there and pray. And they made a bell tower. which reflects exactly the same way of what the uh, earlier parish church is there in the old location so in that way many modifications you can observe they are bringing back the traditions you know so in all these three aspects what we have to three studies what we have to learn here is you know first of all uh, the traditions they don't disappear you know with time they transform they transform and they get they negotiate with the modernity you know they negotiate and they try to establish a particular place for them like in the case what we have seen here is they even brought the symbolic and the semantic versions of it you know so where uh, they brought in the same color and the same style and they built a bell tower and when i have to observe how the people have adapted it's not just a one year or two years but when i started looking at eight years you know the, it has given me a completely different picture of what i have seen five years before or seven years before so in this way we conclude this lecture that yes the concept of second birth to exist but this in the disaster context they the people are positioned into a new field whether it is gujarat earthquake whether it is a latur earthquake whether it is in el savdar so they have to adjust with certain new challenges whether it is a land tenures whether it is a layout of a settlement whether it is a neighbors whether it is a services you know so they have to negotiate with this thing they do negotiate and at the end of the day what we actually see is they bring back certain things they and that is where the traditions negotiate you know 
and they try to accommodate what they got also. You know, in that way they try to adapt. So this is what we learn with this process. Thank you very much.